Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks to join today's session, and hope you all have a great holiday in Kukong. My name is Ken. I'm from Dark Cloud, based in Shanghai, China. And uh, hello, hi. My name is Aldo. Uh, I'm from Google uh, in uh, from in Canada, and uh, together we with Kante and multiple other contributors, we have built this this queue system that we're going to present to you now. Yeah, so today we'd like to talk a bit about uh, uh, building a batch system in cloud with queue. So before we talk about the queue, I, uh, I think it's worth it to mention a bit about what's like something like what's the job. It may be a little funny here to talk uh, this in batch day, but just in case we have some newcomers and who, have, who are interested. So what's the job? Uh, we think it has several p uh, points here, uh, like job we are run to completion. So different from the uh, long running workloads, like the deployments, step sets, they will uh, restart the pods when, uh, when they fall into failures, but jobs will run to completion. And usually for batch jobs, it uh, runs with a group of pods. They may run independently or collaboratively. Uh, for example, uh, like the index job, they will run with a uh, partition index in parallel. And for like the MPI job, they will have the launcher and the worker who will communicate with each other. So also, jobs are flexible. They can run in a different time in, at a different locations, and also they are compatible with a uh, variety of resources. Let's take the time for example. So uh, let's say we have some like uh, uh, latency insensitive workloads, so we can deploy them with, together with uh, uh, sensitive traffic, uh, sensitive service. So when we hit a sudden spike, then, we, then the insensitive workloads will be preempted. So that's what we call a job. And the next question, so why job queuing? I think the answer is uh, uh, easy, uh, easy to answer bec uh, because resources are limited. So like in uh, Prime, we have static cloud, uh, clusters. So if we want to run more jobs in parallel, we, we, may, we may have to jump to the cloud for uh, so-called infinity resources. But, uh, but usually the cloud cannot grow as big as we want, maybe because we may like uh, cons uh, account for the discounts in cloud. And uh, also uh, the uh, Kubernetes default class has a scalability limit like with uh, 5,000 nodes. And also uh, besides the resource limit, uh, uh, limit besides the limited resources, we may have, uh, have uh, jobs with different priorities. So the higher ones maybe have more chance to run uh, than the lower ones. So job queuing can help us there. Okay, back to the uh, key point today. So what is queue? Uh, in one word, uh, queue is a Kubernetes native job, native job queuing. So it can help us to manage the resource, resource quota in multi-tenants uh, with the borrowing and the preemption uh, between different uh, can, uh, tenants. Also, it supports the resource fungibility in heterogeneous clusters. Uh, the resource fungibility means we can define a, you know, a set of resources for the, uh, for the job and they, and they will follow a fall-through policy. Yes, about the support for Q. Uh, actually, we support uh, Kubernetes native job in the first place. And uh, in the last release, we support the uh, Kubeflow MPI job. We did a lot to implement this, like we uh, implement the suspend semantics in uh, Kubeflow MPI job. Uh, with the experience of the MPI job, we believe it will be easier to integrated with Q if we can provide like a control library for the for scaffold. So now you can you can just imp if, if you want to build your own controller, you can just implement the interface which shapes the behaviors of the job. Yeah, we are looking forward to co collaborate with more communities 
and uh, exciting news is from the Tecton uh, uh, Cloud Native CI32, who is also searching for the uh, job queuing solution, and uh, we hope we can do something. Then uh, we'll talk, about, talk a bit about uh, the relationship between the queue and the Kubernetes. So there may be some question like, uh, we do have some projects under the CNCF uh, who, all, who also focus on the job queuing. So why do we, we want to incubate the queue again? I think the, uh, main, uh, the most difference here is about the start point. So queue is focused on the uh, separation of consoles with the uh, default Kubernetes components, uh, especially with the Kube scheduler. So for Kube scheduler, it will focus on the post scheduling, uh, but however, the queue will focus on a more high level uh, workload like job. So for functionalities, queue will, will not overlap with these components. And uh, it, yes, uh, queue is compatible with other uh, Kubernetes components. So like the, you know, the cluster autoscaler, which plays the important role in uh, batch processing. As a result, so Q uh, has close relationships with other Kubernetes six, like the six scheduling, six apps, and we are not under the governance of the batch working group. So if you are interested and uh, don't be hesitant to submit your idea there. Okay, so let's go through how Q works inside the Kubernetes cluster. Actually in Q, we have different responsibilities for different roles. So like for batch admin, uh, which, uh, which behaves like the control plan, so it can create different tenants and uh, set the resource usage limits for different tenants. But for batch users, they can only submit the job, run the job. So let's, let, uh, from the first step, the batch admin may create the uh, core queue uh, uh, APIs, and we assume that with these APIs applied, we have built up a batch system. Then the batch user will submit the jobs uh, with the level name pointing to the queue, the, the real queue, yeah. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here is about uh, the, uh, uh, the spend field. So whatever the uh, job is suspended or not when submitting, if it's under the control of queue, it will be suspended. Then the queue will try to admit the job based on the like the priorities, like the quotas, and uh, if the job fits, the queue will inject the scheduling directives like the node affinity, and also, yes, uh, unsuspend the job. Then we'll, we'll go through the normal Kubernetes flow, like job control, we'll watch the uh, unsuspended job and create the create the pause, and the scheduler will try to schedule all the pause. And if there is not enough resource in the cluster, the cluster auto scheduler will get on board. Yes. And then I will hand over to Eldo for the API pass and the several user cases. So next I'm gonna explain uh, some use cases, uh, some close to real world use cases that uh, you can enable through Q. Uh, so for that, we need to understand a little bit uh, about the APIs that we use. Um, we, as, as, as we mentioned earlier, we look at two types of users, the batch administrator and the end users, the researchers, etc. So let, let me start with the, the APIs that researchers uh, kind of have a view of. So most importantly, a researcher will just use the job API. Um, that's, of, uh, traditionally, the V1 job API, but it could be others like MPI job, Qflow, Qflow APIs, TensorFlow, etc. Um, so that's the primarily API uh, that the, the user will send. So the user just writes a regular job, a regular Kubernetes job, uh, and we will see that there is a, a label here, a special label that Q understands, with, which has the name of the Q. So, and then this queue uh, is, a, is an object that the end, the end user observes, is able to list, can, can see which queues are available to, 
to them, but the, they, don't really, they don't really need to create it or interact with it. Um, and additionally, um, we, Q manages some metadata for the job um, about like how, how pe like if it's pending, why it's pending, uh, how many resources extra are needed, et cetera, et cetera. This is all hidden uh, or stored in this uh, internal API that we call workload. And this cluster Q API is the next side of the equation that I will, I will explain, which is basically the administration point of view. So as I was saying, the other user of Q is the administrator, and they, they have potentially the most complicated uh, um, task of setting up the cluster to, to enable resource sharing, et cetera. Um, here, down here, um, we have the nodes. So these are the nodes of the cluster. And as uh, most Kubernetes clusters, you will have um, different types of nodes, right? Uh, um, here, I'm highlighting standard and spot. So these are different uh, provisioning um, guarantees for, for nodes that happen to have different prices. So you could have those, or you could have different models of GPUs. Um, so all, all of these um, details about the nodes, you can abstract them uh, using these resource flavor objects. And then the, the administrator can set up quotas for each of these resources. So here we have two cluster queues uh, using these resources. On, here on the left, uh, you have a, an example of a cluster queue object. Uh, in this case, these cluster queues are governing two quotas for CPU and memory, and we have two flavors. So a flavor for standard, standard VMs, uh, or on-demand, they're also called, and spot VMs. Um, so, and then we can define the quotas for, for, the, for this, for this uh, queue. Um, so with that uh, background, uh, let's jump now into one, one example. Um, so in this case, let's imagine the most uh, simple example where we have one user for one cluster. Probably not the real world, but let's start from there. Um, but uh, we have actually uh, the, uh, an heterogeneous cluster where we have spot VMs and on-demand, or even we have, let's say, uh, committed discounts uh, in, in this cluster. So you have, uh, the user has bought 40, 40 CPUs of committed discount, but also they want to be able to go over their commitment if uh, there are too many jobs and they have a certain quota for, for spot. So uh, this is the, the cluster queue object, right? Now, the cluster queue object is a primarily uh, administration object. The end, end user facing object is the local queue, uh, which is namespace. So this is gonna be in the namespace of the user because we're only, in this example, we only have one user. That's the default namespace. Uh, and then this object points to the cluster queue for, for the resources. Um, and then we have a couple of uh, resource flavors. Uh, one resource flavor representing, in this case, the reservation or the discounts. Uh, and in this case, I'm using the uh, official labels from GKE that um, are associated to, to the standard VMs. And we have another um, resource flavor that represents the VMs uh, of type spot. And also, I'm using here the, the label for that. So this resource flavor, each of these resource flavors are associated to a set of nodes in the cluster. And on the other hand, so that's the administration side of uh, things. And the, on the other side, we just have the researcher running a job. Uh, again, it's the basic job API, the same, the same old, except that it has this, um, this extra label that points to the queue. So, now all the jobs will go, uh, will be queued uh, in, in, in this queue, right? And if I still have quota, they will keep starting. If, if uh, we don't have quota, they will be suspended. Now, initially, 
let's say I create a job and they, there is quota for my reservation. That's the first one that is going to be used. So Q will select the, re the re reservation flavor and it will inject this node selector into, it, it will inject this node selector into the job. This guarantees that all the pods in the job will run in the same set of VMs. You don't, you generally don't want your, your job to have um, pods in different, in, in nodes of different flavors. Um, but that's, let's say the, the capacity or the quota for reservation is exhausted, then actually um, Q might decide to put everything in the spot, spot flavor. And then this is the pri primary API in which Q communicates with the rest of the Kubernetes system. You just inject the node selector, and when kubescaler picks it up, it knows exactly in which kind of nodes it needs to be uh, scheduled. Um, with that, I, I want to, um, so that's the pri first use case. Uh, before we talk about the next use case, I want to talk uh, about a new feature that we introduced in the latest release, uh, which is preemption. Uh, preemption is basically the idea that if I have enough capacity, I can keep adding jobs, right? Um, but um, if the, a new job comes in that has a higher priority, um, we should make space for it. Uh, that's, one, that's one case. But uh, in Q, there is also the possibility of sharing resources. So in this case, we have two cluster queues, uh, one cluster queue for the team A and another cluster queue for a team B. Let's imagine uh, they both look roughly the same. So team, this is the team A definition uh, for the team A cluster queue definition. And we can see that it has an assigned quota of 40. So this is the 40 we see here. And it has a borrowing limit of 20. So it can actually borrow anything that the other cluster queue is not using up to, up to 40 plus 20, right, 60. So let's say I'm, a, I'm running like this. These are all my jobs uh, on, on each of the teams. And a new job comes in, it can borrow because the other, cluster, the other team is not using the resources, so we can borrow those resources. Um, another job comes in, still, we can still borrow. But then team B wants to run a new job. Now, this... Uh, Team A was actually borrowing from Team B, right? So we don't, we want to recover that quota for Team A because that's, it's what they, it belongs to them. So we can issue uh, preemption. So let's, uh, we can basically evict one job from Team A, which was borrowing, and then we can accept, we can admit this job uh, from uh, Team B. So, and now we are happy, we, we are like, um, respecting everybody's, everybody's quotas, but when, again, when there is no, res, uh, not all the resources uh, are used, we can still borrow resources back. Um, so that's one case, one case of preemption. Here we have another case of preemption um, where actually we have jobs with different priorities. Here, bigger number mean, means higher priority. Um, so we have this, all these jobs running and then a new job comes in, in this case from team A. Um, we cannot really preempt jobs in team B because we would be violating their quota. But uh, this spot, this uh, job D has higher priority. So we can inspect which of the jobs has less priority and we can evict it. And then we can admit this, um, this job. So all of this can be handled by by Q. Here in this example, I minimized. This is only one resource, so we can look at things linearly. But of course, uh, it works across CPU, memory, like whatever you want to define. Um, it, it can work on all, all those dimensions. And it can work across different flavors as well. So that's uh, preemption. And with this concept, we can uh, implement um, implement a bigger system with two, in this case, two teams that can borrow resources from each other. So uh, how, how do we manifest this in, uh, in the Q APIs? First, we have 
two, um, two teams. Uh, sorry, we have one team, Team A, uh, each, uh, which has two researchers. Each researcher has its own namespace. And the way we are defining the team is using these labels. This, uh, the same label, Team A, they are, means that they are part of the same team. And then we can define a cluster queue. Uh, as you can see here, there is a namespace selector that matches these labels in the namespaces. So this is how we define that the cluster queue is for these namespaces, or in this case, this team. And we have some quota here um, that they can use. So they can, they can completely share this quota. Um, and then we can establish the local queue objects objects which are the ones that are actually namespace. So this, these two, um, they match the same namespace and we are matching here the cluster queues and the same on the other, for the other researcher. Um, and this is one side, one team. If we have another team here, um, they, they are maybe a smaller team so it has a less quota, nominal quota of 40. Um, and the crucial uh, part of the API here is that they are part of the same cohort. Uh, when, when two cluster queues are part of the same cohort, it means that they can share uh, the, the quota that is not being used among each other. And you can also uh, control how much you can borrow. Like, you might allow to borrow everything, uh, but you can also control, like, I don't want to borrow all the and use quota, I want to control to some level uh, how much uh, we can borrow. So that's uh, it for the use cases. Uh, yes, we just uh, released a, a new, a new version is, uh, several weeks ago. It's 0.3.0, and uh, we introduced quite a lot of features in this release. So the first part is about the API. Now we bump the API to better and uh, we respect the Kubernetes deployment policy. So if you are using a low one, like the alpha level, we encourage you to uh, migrate to the latest one. And we add um, quite a lot of ad ad uh, validation in the webhook, so for the robustness, robustness of the queue. And the next is about the preemption. Yes, just uh, Edo just uh, introduced quite a lot about it. So we now support uh, the preemption inside a class queue or between different class queues. And uh, in this release, we add support for the MPI job v1 better two. And we also provide a, a control library for easy integrators. So if you, yes, you can refer to the template. And the next is about uh, the option feature with for post ready. So it's, it's, it acts like a sequential admission. So it means uh, if the, uh, the job will be admitted until all its previous jobs getting ready. You can enable it. It's, it's disabled and if you want to use it, you should uh, uh, disable in the flags. Uh, because queue is sensitive to the resources, so we make uh, it aware of the limit ranges and the port overhead. And last but not least, uh, we thanks, thanks for all the contributors in the last release. They are from different uh, companies, different uh, countries, and uh, also different communities. Uh, much appreciate. And about our last uh, next release, so we mainly focus on the ex uh, existing uh, features like the wait for post ready and the preemption. It, uh, it, it, it would be nice to have some features like uh, dynamic quota reclaiming because now we only reclaim the jobs when the job finishes. Also, we want to add more support for the uh, uh, other jobs like the Ray, also jobs in Kubeflow. Yes, and if you are interested and if you, and you can contribute your ideas here. Uh, so uh, I guess if someone has some interest with the project, you can visit our new website. Yes, we have a new website. And also participate in the batch working group. 
also find some issues and uh, we welcome every kind of contribut contributions. So this is our new logo. Yeah, pretty much for today's session. And uh, any questions? Thank you guys for the amazing uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions about this system. Uh, first one, I want to understand, so if I keep sending jobs, you say, if you go back to the slide where you show the like baseline architecture from the, uh, when the user submits a job, I think it was one of the first ones. Yeah, this one. So basically here on the right side, we see user which creates a job and you put it into suspended mode. What if I keep sending jobs? Will I eventually overload the API server? So you, you don't have any external storage component here. So I assume it all ends up in EDCD. So basically, what's the limit for this system then? So can I basically overload the class with jobs in the end? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the, the key thing here is that uh, we are working at the job level. So because we are suspending the job, even if your job is a parallel job of 1,000 pods or even bigger, there is only one object, which is the job. So from this, that's already a starting point where we have a much, lo much lower load on API server because we are not, uh, we are not allowing these pods to even be created. Um, so that's a, a big um, starting point for, for the scalability. Uh, but uh, resource, you can still use resource quotas to, you know, control, like, put these failover mechanisms, not about, like, um, usage of the jobs, but about, like, uh, tipping points for your cluster. Because in any system, you, you will have a tipping point, right? Uh, and you can still use uh, Kubernetes resource quotas uh, to define those scalability limits. Um, and if the user exhausted that, well, they will have to retry uh, the, the job creation. Okay, uh, the ne next uh, small question would be, um, if we take Airflow as an example, as a system that I can use basically for the same purpose uh, with a bit of uh, Python code on top, um, I can also use Airflow to do job scheduling multi across multiple different clusters. But in this case, I'm limited to a single cluster. That's correct, right? But what about namespaces? Can I at least, uh, does this work across namespaces in the cluster or we are bound to a single namespace here? Uh, so if I want we, uh, separate we, we, namespaces we, for different teams and then yes. I want to have a cluster queues that target different namespaces as well. Yes, uh, the queue APIs give you all the flexibility. So you can define a team to be one namespace, or you can define a team to be a set of namespaces. That's something you can control within the APIs. Uh, so yes, it's multi-tenant multi within a single cluster. Uh, to answer the other part of your question, today Q is a single cluster, but uh, we are already uh, thinking about multi-cluster, and there is a contributor that uh, we'll share some some news, um, some initial like design uh, in the working group. So if you wanna, if you want to participate uh, and learn more about the multi-cluster plans, you can join uh, the next working group match, uh, batch meetings, uh, and we we will have this discussion uh, sometime soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I think we're out of time, but uh, our next, next speakers, speakers are Rishit and Shivai. I couldn't see them. Can you raise your hand if you're here, hopefully? Ah, they're there, okay, cool.